thank you very, very much for joining. Um, welcome to our fourth DE&I webinar. Um, in today's webinar, we're going to be focusing on equity um, in the workplace in regards to gender specifically. Um, we're very excited to have our amazing speakers here and for all of you to join. Um, just to give a very quick intro, my name is Isabel Anchebe. Um, I, lead, I lead our European compliance practice here at Danos, and I'm also the head of our DEI committee. Hi there, I'm Mark Morby. I'm a managing director at the Danos Group and lead our risk practice. For uh, those of you who may not be familiar with the Danos Group, we're a specialist search firm providing permanent and interim compliance, risk, and legal talent on a retained and contingent basis to a global client base from our offices in London, Hong Kong, uh, Singapore, and New York. So just before we get started, um, a few house rules. Um, firstly, this webinar will be recorded. Um, please stay on mute. Um, we do have questions at the end, and we do encourage questions, so please do ask questions, but please using our chat function. So if you have any questions, drop them down in the chat, and at the end, we will ask the speakers um, the questions you've put through. Right, so let's get started. I'm super excited to be introducing our first speaker, um, Autumn Naliva, who is our Chief Compliance Officer and MLRO at CIBC Capital Markets in Luxembourg. Thank you very much, Autumn, over to you. <laughs> thank you, Isabel, and thank you for correctly pronouncing my surname. I'm originally from Guernsey in the Channel Islands, so the name is never pronounced as people think. So I really appreciate that. So a little bit, bit about me. As Isabel mentioned, I'm currently Chief Compliance Officer and MLRO for a capital markets business, um, part of the CIBC of Bank um, here in Luxembourg. I moved to Luxembourg five years ago um, to further develop my career. There were more senior opportunities here, but also to give my children the opportunity to live in um, in a bigger place. We're originally from, from Guernsey. So it was really a twofold um, plan for me to, to give my children a, a different life and also develop my career professionally. I'm going to be speaking really very much from my own personal experience um, as a working parent, um, but also from having led a uh, diversity committees previously about sort of women's corporate experiences, how to navigate the workplace, how to advocate for yourself and really importantly, achieve a good work-life balance, but also speak from experience about some really um, helpful ways to attract, support and retain female talent. And to start off, I really want to keep my compliance hat on and say gender diversity really matters. The European Central Bank continues to hold gender diversity as one of its, its prime, uh, prime goals and, and an area where it sees significant progress still to be made because gender diverse boards make better decisions. When you have the right balance of male and female uh, members, we see better risk management and better decision making. Um, a review from 2020 to 2022 showed that of 361 new CEO appointments um, that the ECB uh, reviewed because of the institutions being directly supervised, more than 300 were men. Um, there's not a good story when it comes to new appointments of, of board members in terms of the gender balance. So it's somewhere where it's really important that specifically in the, the financial sector, people do more. And it's something I'm, I'm happy to do as part of my day job, given, given the compliance link there. So um, as I mentioned in my introduction, I'm a working parent, um, working at quite a senior level, um, currently in capital markets, previously in asset management and private banking. I'm not just a working parent, I'm a single mom and have been for most of my career, which adds a whole other layer to the reality of, of working life and how I've had to learn to navigate the workplace. Um, and I've never really had a role model to look up to because you don't really often see single parents at, at this level and in these kind of leadership roles. Um, and that's partly because it's really hard work. <laughs> you have um, you have a lot to do, your, your mum and dad to the children. For me, having also relocated, I lost my family support network. So I've had to learn 
on the hoof, as it were, how to be really effective as a leader, really effective as a compliance professional, whilst also being a, a super effective parent to some children who were lifted out of their homeland to, um, to a country where they don't even speak the same language. So I guess in terms of how I came to be where I am today, um, is that I didn't just let things happen. I've always had a personal strategic plan. And I think this is really important, especially as women, because it's not something we maybe naturally think about doing. And that strategic plan hasn't just been about my career, but it's been a vision for the whole of my life, for my children, for my work, for myself. So um, what I've, I've always kept up to date is a is a one, three, five year plan, which states exactly what I want to be doing, what I want to have delivered for my children. Um, and then, you know, identifying stakeholders, the needs, you know, what I need to do for myself. So it becomes a, a budget forecast too. You know, if I want to move up another level from this, I know I'm going to need more wraparound childcare and I'm definitely going to need someone to do my ironing. So I need to factor in the pay increase that I'm going to need to get so I can deliver that. So I think it's never thinking about things in isolation and by being really careful in the planning, you can really become an advocate for yourself. And then I think it's also really important that we explain the reality of our circumstances. You should never assume that people really know what's going on in the background. When I sort of fly into the office uh, with hair a little disheveled at quarter to nine in the morning, people don't really know that at 6 a.m. I was waking up to get my children dressed and lunches packed and make sure they're off to the school bus at 7.12 precisely and then making my own way on the commute. So make sure people actually know. Otherwise, you know, they're never going to actually understand the differences and therefore the accommodations they can give to, to really give equity. Um, seek sponsors and allies. Seek people who will really advocate for you, who will see what you can bring to the table. And I'm really fortunate to have had a lot of people say, you know, Autumn's really good at this, but they've understood, you know, some of the, the constraints I might have as, as a, a single parent or a parent full, full stop and really been able to support and advocate for me. Um, and yeah, be, just be really, really precise in your planning and what you want to achieve. So what have I seen is that um, it's it's really, you know, important to kind of categorise your life, to make sure that at work you can really, really focus. And when you finish work, you can focus on the family. Um, there's um, some wonderful, wonderful articles. And, and one that made a big difference to me was a Harvard Business Review article, Manage Your Energy, Not Your Time, which really talks about ways to take care of yourself and make sure you just focus on the one thing at the time. So during my working day, I'm not thinking about house management, childcare issues. And similarly, I carve out at least two hours every evening to really focus on my children, my house and my family. And I don't let myself think about work. As soon as you start processing these different things, it becomes quite frankly exhausting. So that's really important. And it might be as simple as, right, at six o'clock, kids, we're going to do some Lego or we're going to go out and do some gardening and just not even be tempted to touch the Blackberry, the mobile. So I think that's that's really, really important to keep that sense of health um, and tea. I would say Yorkshire tea saves me to keep the energy up during the day. Um, I'm very lucky that I have colleagues reg regularly visiting from London who can bring me my new supply. And to me, that's um, that's super important. So to summarise, you know, speak up, make sure people understand the reality of your life, because if people don't know, they'll never even try to be accommodating. Be yourself, because it's exhausting not to be, um, and have your own strategic plan and seek support from others in really delivering and, and executing on that. And then I guess I can talk a little bit about some of my experiences um, both from initiatives I've run as part of uh, executive committee diversity initiatives, but also what's really worked for me as a working parent. <clears throat> so I think 
the primary focus of employees has to be on the concept of equity and not equality. Because if you treat everybody the same, then you're not actually supporting those who are actually different and therefore have different needs. And that really can only happen if you really listen to and understand your employees, your team members, your colleagues. So listen to the truth of how their lives are. Because, yeah, um, being a single parent is more likely to affect women. It could also affect men. But similarly, having caring responsibilities is more likely to impact women. And that does mean that some things are going to be more of a challenge. Um, From that, having committed to equity and really listened, you can start to build in flexibility as to how you manage people and let them manage themselves. So for example, the dress code here permits trainers. And this saves my life because every morning you wouldn't believe me running for the bus and then running back home because I always forget exactly what time it comes. And without being able to wear trainers in the office, I'd I'd not manage. Um, But then you also might think about the the working hours patterns. Do you want to just insist that people are in core hours in the working day and that work from home either side is acceptable? Because frankly, lots of us have to travel in in peak hours, which means you're losing time in the commute. Um, Actually, can you be flexible around when you want people in the office? Travel can be really difficult for parents. And I guess the most accommodating I ever had um, was when my my little boy, who's now 10, was a newborn and I took a new role requiring travel. And I explained very, very clearly, I'm not going to be able to travel for at least six months because he's a newborn. I'm going to be breastfeeding. The first week I joined, they said, we've got a new manager, a new regional head. We'd really like you to meet him. It would help you. We'd like you to go to Zurich next week. And I said... I told you, I've got this newborn, I I can't just leave him. Um, 20 minutes later, the phone rang, Autumn, we have a solution. Find a a relative, a friend, we're gonna fly you, a friend and your baby out to Zurich. We've set up a meeting room so you can breastfeed and we're gonna put you up. And just to be really clear, these weren't meetings where I had to be physically present. They believed it would help me in my career to do this. And I'm, I still get goosebumps when I think about this. And my little one, Caspian, had done 14 flights by the time he was a year old because they believed in me and, and wanted to help. And obviously it served him really well in, um, in life. And I, I guess it also really opened up people's minds to how you can be flexible. So the very last thing I wanted to mention was really about being inclusive around time planning. So lots of employee events tend to happen right after work. The after work drinks and events are really popular. For people who are working parents, single parents, single moms, that can be really challenging. So think about being inclusive and move, moving some of these networking events, these, these general employee events to the lunchtime when people are on court hours. And that doesn't just go for employers, but it goes for service providers. The number of events I have to, I have to reject is, um, it's really quite surprising. Um, but I need to go home and do homework with the kids and, and get them bathed. And that's important to me. Um, so really, that's what I wanted to say. Some some really personal anecdotes there. But I think it really, really matters that we, we get this right and support each other to achieve the ultimate goal of better gender diversity. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Autumn, for that. Some, some really great points that I particularly made a note about managing energy, not time as something uh, yeah. I think we could all take on board and, uh, and make sure that we're doing better at. And um, the Yorkshire tea. And we Yorkshire need, tea. Everyone needs some Yorkshire tea. <laughs> um, moving on to our, our second speaker, uh, we have Dippy McKernan, Managing Director of Risk Transformation at m Wealth and Non-Executive Director at Progress Together. Uh, Dippy, over to you. Hello, um, delighted to be here. Thank you very much for the introduction and what great um, uh, suggestions from Autumn. Uh, I'm definitely going to take those on board. I'll go and get my Yorkshire tea now. Um, So I have been in financial services uh, for over 25 years. I've done a whole range of different things in that time. I'm currently um, managing director at M&G. Before that, I was the global head of first line risk within Fidelity International and further back um, 
uh, used to work for the UK regulator, the FCA. I've worked at Deutsche Bank. I've worked at Barclays, all in relatively senior roles. I've also, um, at Fidelity, was the um, CEO for the UK and sat on the board of the UK company. So uh, have had that executive experience. Um, and in addition to that, I'm, as you've said, a non-executive director of a membership body called Progress Together, which focuses on social mobility within financial services. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, I'm also a mum, like Autumn, uh, of two. Uh, this week we had GCSEs. So that was uh, quite taxing, sort of focused on worrying about what was going on um, at work as well as worrying about what was going on at home. Um, I've also been, for much of my career, a leader. So a leader of people. And so I think that's the uh, sort of another responsibility that we mustn't forget. So we spend our time focusing on what's going on at home, but also focusing on what's going on with our teams and supporting them in the right way and dealing with various challenges. And often I'm um, running programs that require headcount reductions or growing functions. And so that people aspect of it is also not to be underestimated. And I think we... How we acquire lots of skill, skills, both men and women through our careers that become quite transferable. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and throughout those 25 years, I would say the thing that's been quite constant is this desire I have to learn and learn about the organisations I'm working in, but also learn more about me as a person and how, you know, how I manage my resilience how I maintain my levels of authenticity and how I leverage sponsors and mentors throughout my career. Because unlike Autumn, I didn't have a, career, a clear career path. I didn't have that plan that said, okay, in five years time, I'm gonna do this. Uh, it, it has really evolved over time. Um, and in fact, I didn't really have many aspirations when I left school other than to have a regular income. So I started to work at the place that was closest to me, which was my sort of local Barclays office um, in East London. And, you know, head down, working hard as we are great at doing, um, just got me promoted and, and moved moved up the chain. So. So I think uh, I'll talk a little bit about sort of learnings from my career. But before I do that, I want to talk about progress together. So over those that, that career history, the other thing that I have done quite actively is focused on giving back as much as I can. And um, coming from a lower socioeconomic background, the area that I could add value to is, is from a diversity and inclusion perspective, both from um, a sponsoring initiatives within Deutsche Bank and the FCA and also Fidelity, but also being um, the lead and the storyteller, if you like, for socioeconomic diversity. And it was at Fidelity, I um, had the opportunity to work on a government led task force, which focused on improving social mobility within financial services. Um, and through that task force was appointed as a non-executive director to the board of this membership body. And so um, the reason I bring it up today is because there is a really important intersectionality point, which is that women tend to struggle more than their male peers, both in terms of their careers, but also specifically with respect to things like socioeconomic diversity. So women from lower socioeconomic backgrounds are 21% slower in getting to senior positions. Women like me that are both, both come from a lower socioeconomic background, but also um, um, are, are not white, also struggle even more. So there's only 1% of us in senior leadership positions in financial services. And there is lots of interest in this space, particularly one, because it's the right thing to do. We know that firms that are diverse are more profitable, they have higher levels of um, innovation, but also they reduce the propensity of things like groupthink, which is, from a regulatory perspective, a huge risk for firms. Um, it, so it is absolutely the right thing to do. But also our investors and our, our shareholders are now starting to ask more about socioeconomic diversity and gender, particularly when we talk about things like ESG and the S within ESG, when we talk about consumer duty um, and demonstrating empathy with our customers. So firms have to now 
demonstrate that they're representing the societies in which they serve. And there's a real opportunity for us as women to take more of those senior leadership positions. Um, and so there, you know, there, there, there's huge opportunities for us to step into those roles. And I think one of the things that we have to be particularly minded about is and I talked about it earlier, growing and evolving with the industries that we're working in. So I've just joined another task force. I've been asked to, to sit on a task force, which is looking at women and um, supporting them to acquire digital skills, to move into professions, middle of their career, where they haven't had a technology background, they haven't done any training from a digital perspective. How do we support those women to acquire those skills for the future? So how do we think about the workforce for the future and how do we encourage women to take those opportunities and balance it with all the other responsibilities that they have? And often women are the primary carers, not always, but often. And so how do we encourage you know what kind of tools and, and support do we put around them so we can fill that skills gap because there will continue to be a skills gap particularly in the UK um, and understanding how we can evolve and be relevant for that changing industry I think it is really key so in terms of my career I think the things that have put me in good stead are constantly being curious not always having a plan, being quite open and agile to different opportunities, putting your hand up, thinking about the value you can add and the transferable skills you have, um, whether that's, you know, uh, problem solving or whether that's, you know, making uh, a solution with very limited resources. All of those things are actually quite effective leadership capabilities that you can that, that you can translate from the work outside you do. Uh, sorry, the work you do outside of your your day job um, into your your leadership role. Be bold and reflect on the things that um, make a difference to the the organisation that you're working in. Don't be afraid to put your to ask the difficult questions, but obviously in the right way. Reflect on the way that you operate. Um, are there things that you could be doing differently? Um, are there situations that you've learned from and that, that and there is a statement, isn't there, about failing fast? I think that's really important. So don't give yourself a hard time when things don't go according to plan, but do learn from those experiences. Understand how you manage your resiliency so you know how what is it that you do to keep yourself resilient so for me I love to run I'm not very good at it but I do love to do it and so I do that on a regular basis just to manage all those other competing things I have going on and finally particularly important for women understand your value because while I haven't had a sort of you know a firm five-year, 10-year plan, what I have done is understand the value that I can bring to organisations and understand my own value, so not compromise on opportunities and, and constantly remind myself of the things that, that I've done and the, the opportunities that, um, that I have brought to firms that I've worked in. And so do, do think about those things. And do um, and do continue to, to appreciate the value that you're adding to firms and put your hand up because you never know what opportunities you might get out of that. Thank you very much, Dipino. That was amazing. And, you know, be bold. And um, especially as a female, I think that was really good to take from that, that, you know, sometimes you might be nervous to ask that question. But like you said, don't be afraid to ask that question in the right way. Um, but don't be afraid to ask that question. Yeah, and understand your value. So. Thank you very much, Dippy. Um, I'll be moving now to our third and final speaker, um, Warren Stapley. He's a lawyer and award-winning DE&I strategist. Thank you very much, Warren. Over to you. Thanks, Isabel. Uh, hi, everyone. So I'm uh, Warren Stapley, and um, I spent the vast majority of my career as a corporate finance lawyer training in the magic circle, as uh, many people on the call will know about, sort of those kind of firms, um, sort of very much the sharp end of corporate practice. Um, in 21, I left um, corporate law behind and went into effectively turn my volunteering into my job um, and went into DEI. So until very recently, I was the head of DEI for a property consultant based here in London. Uh, I'm now currently um, sort of shifting towards more sort of the charity and social justice space, especially with everything that's going on in the world. That's very much where my interest tends to lie. 
However, what's been quite interesting, actually, is that having had so much experience of corporate environments, um, you pick up a few things uh, along the way. And really, um, my observations today are say a few bits and pieces um, focused on gender equity, sort of around sort of positive action versus positive discrimination. Um, there's a few people out there who still sort of have a tendency to conflate the two and there's some real, um, often legal and compliance implications for why that is problematic. And also, um, I'd like to say a few things about male allyship as well. So I think starting especially as the other, uh, as, as Autumn and, uh, and Dippy did as well, very kindly shared um, their personal lived experience. Um, what was quite striking to me was actually um, leaving the law behind and going out into DEI and therefore effectively corresponding with a completely different world. So even though I was very familiar with the subject matter, dealing with recruiters and in terms of their mandates, in terms of filling the role and how they went about that role and what they were looking for and who they were looking for, it was fascinating to get on video calls with them. I mean, being deaf, it's a, it's a problem for me as a hearing aid user. I can't actually use telephones the regular way. So that's always a reasonable adjustment for people to uh, bear in mind at the outset. But I'd be there on a video call. And um, quite often, recruiters would um, disclose, and uh, they won't be named, but there was one law firm and one bank back in um, 22, late 21, early 22, and the recruiters did actually say to me, well, you've got a great CV, you've got a lot of DEI experience. However, um, we have got it, you know, pretty much, you know, as a, as a mandate that we're seeking a black person for this role. And uh, our, um, our client is very worried about the optics of having a DEI person being white. And that was very interesting because it's the first time that I encountered it. I, I suspected it and I'd heard about it, but it was the first time that I'd ever encountered this idea of employers effectively sort of putting this forward. And it was interesting as a recruiter, they said, well, you know, our, my client's very much pursuing the positive action. And um, I had to sort of jump up at that stage, the lawyer in me, you know, with the knowledge I have of the Equality Act, uh, I had to jump in at that stage and say, um, well, you probably should. I said, this conversation won't take much longer and I respect your position, but you are actually in the realms of positive discrimination there. You are effectively tokenizing. I mean, that's a word people are very familiar with. And no marginalized person has ever wanted to be installed in a role based on their protected characteristics. I have never met a person who wants to be tokenized into a role, even if it meant any level of prestige or salary or promotion or anything else like that. So I'm afraid that is going on behind the scenes. But a lot of it, to the credit, is that we're not talking about malevolent recruiters or clients here in the background doing the devil's work. What we are doing here is we're dealing with people who are genuinely confused about what the law is and what it requires. And so... To be quite clear, positive action, which is what they were saying that they were doing, is perfectly legal. It's enshrined within the Quality, Equality Act 2010. It's allowed. It's effectively a tiebreaker situation. It comes up very often when you're looking at recruitment, when you're looking at promotions, and you're dealing with this idea that where you have, through an objectively established criteria, you have two people or a group of people, and you're having to choose between them, and you have an established deficit, underrepresented people within your workforce, and there that person then comes through the process. The tiebreaker of positive action allows you to say, well, they've scored the same in this, they are equally able, based on the criteria that we've reasonably put forward, to do the job. And therefore, we have identified a need, and therefore we're choosing this person. That is entirely different from the positive discrimination that I alluded to before, where we simply say, we are going to choose this person because they're a woman, or because they're black, or because they're anything, in my case, because they're disabled. If I apply to Stonewall, I'm chosen because I'm an LGBTQ plus person, which I am, incidentally. I know I do a great impression of a straight person, but suffice to say, it's one of those things that actually, it, confusion is rife. And a topical example of it occurred last year, actually, and many of you will be familiar with the RAF, and they got themselves into real trouble. 
because what they, again, were, were dressing up one of their training initiatives as being positive action. And it was, in fact, found and it was widely reported on that it was indeed positive discrimination. And what you had were quite aggressive targets. They were targets, of course, diversity targets, where they said, OK, so for the force, we need to have 40 percent women and we need to have 20 percent ethnic minorities. Now, those targets were to be met by 2030. They were miles away. It wasn't going to happen. So very stressed hiring managers and people in charge of the training felt under immense pressure to tokenize certain individuals to meet those targets. So in practice, in a nutshell, it meant specifically holding a group of white men back from being able to participate in that training. And what ended up happening was, of course, a group of people, racialized women, in fact, were put forward for training and to meet those targets and indeed the wheels fall off very quickly. So you see that what employers need to be very mindful of is that nobody wants to be tokenized. Positive action is a very good aspect of the Equality Act. It's something that everybody really should be taking account of. But there are ways and means to do it in a way that doesn't leave you open to legal and compliance risk. And one of the other things that I've seen, actually, especially in the market, is HR managers and so on, and other people, uh, talent acquisition managers, talk often about should we have a positive action policy? Should we enshrine this in the way that we do business? And in fact, my recommendation there is that you're actually fraught with risk in doing so, because positive action, even though it's found in the Equality Act, I'm a brilliant fan of the Equality Act, but you'll actually find that all too often these good intentions can tip into positive discrimination. And that is a real issue because it can then be struck down for disgruntled applicants who lose out and that will find you in, in an employment tribunal. So that's a risk and compliance point that we have to be aware of. The flip side of this, of course, is that, as has rightly been said, there's a difference between equity and equality. Equity is absolutely key. You can't just treat everybody equally. We have to treat people according to their needs. Positive action used well is a way to ensure that that becomes part of the spirit of how you do business. It doesn't need to be codified in a policy and it doesn't need to be pursued via aggressive quotas that lead to tokenization. So instead, what we have to be doing with we have to actually really be focusing on workplace culture because when you're looking, as Dippy actually mentioned before, you say when you look at things through an intersectional perspective, it's quite clear that different people will need different interventions in order to succeed. And one thing actually that before I get on to talking about uh, how it segues quite nicely into male allyship is that Autumn rightly raised when she was talking about a personal strategic plan. And Dippy said as well, always have a plan. And what's quite fascinating about that is that when you actually then try to apply the plan and all of your planning and all of your brilliance and all of your talents, quite often it can be dashed against the rocks of organizational culture. And there's a well-known adage that talks about how culture eats strategy for breakfast. And so with all of the plans, the personal strategic plans, all of the showing up and being brilliant all of the time, it's not necessarily going to ensure that women are treated fairly at work. And it's not going to ensure, because personally, having had male privilege my whole life, the game is rigged. I'm afraid the game is rigged. And I'm going to say that as a man, because in fact, we're constantly dealing with this idea that women have to overcome. Women are always overcoming. They're always reaching up, jumping up, grabbing the bar. There's always something else. It's always jam tomorrow. It's always next year, maybe you'll make it. And I've seen this a lot in law firms and banks, especially where there are actually desperate needs for positive action to be taken because we do need to be very intentional with our interventions. But you have this narrative right now of this idea of men having to step up to be change agents, change makers. 
but I'm not convinced that men actually necessarily know the extent of the problems. I'm not convinced that they understand that these are not interpersonal issues. It's a deep systemic one that if you keep digging down and digging down, eventually the shovel will hit patriarchy. And the hallmark of privilege is that it's not a problem if it doesn't affect you personally. So the interventions that we're looking at from a male allyship perspective have to be coached. They have to be long term. They can't be one off lunchtime unconscious bias trainings. We can't rely on the capacity of individual men to be mentors and sponsors. That unfortunately relies on the benevolence of particular individuals. And that historically has not worked out well. It might work out for this individual or that individual, but systemically we can see from the stats that it still isn't working. So we have to view gender equity, not just as women's work, but very much as a workplace issue. We have to consider, even though it's a subject of another topic, but where trans people will fit into that, where non-binary people will fit into that, the full gamut of what gender equity is actually going to mean in the workplace going forward. Thank you very much, Warren, for that. Some really great points, and I think, um, as you said, you know, really important for everybody to realize the extent of the issues um, and to make sure that it is dealt with at an organizational level uh, rather than just on an individual level. Yeah, and I even there's I wrote this down word for word, which I really liked. Um, it's not women's work, but it's a workplace issue, and I think that's a great kind of way to summarize that. Thank you, Warren. Thanks to um, all, all three of our speakers there. We've just got a, a few questions um, that have come through uh, that we're going to jump to now. So if I may, I'm going to start off with, with Autumn, um, although um, you know everyone else might want to, to jump in. But what strategies have proven effective in attracting and retaining senior females within organisations that you've worked at, um, as well as obviously the, the travel support you had? It'd be great to see if there's other examples you could share. Yeah, I think... What's been really, really important has been very public commitments to that kind of organisational equity, you know, because to attract the talent, you need to trust the brand, as it were. Um, and I think that's that's really important. So, um, you know, institutions that are really behind, you know, 100 women in finance, this kind of thing, because, you know, especially if you're doing a role like risk or compliance, you do your due diligence on everything you can to find out about the culture and especially if you're a woman I think that matters so I think you've, you've got this side you know the, the attracting the supporting um you know I think women do start from a few steps or yards behind you know that there is a very real male privilege and organizational culture still is more set up to that sort of patriarchal norms so I think there's a lot to do um, and I've benefited from this but specific programs to support potential future female leaders um, sort of giving you in a way the the inside code to understand what really lies beneath the culture and how then to become an advocate for yourself and and really it's, it's thanks to one of those programs that I did make my way to Luxembourg I learned some of the the tools I needed I needed to use and, and in turn that helped my employer at the time reach their target in terms of percentage female leaders so I think you know there's there's the very public and very authentic commitments um but then really active um active steps to to acknowledge um the impact of, of initiatives to support women in in those transitions excellent thank you very oh, much excellent. for that autumn um dippy if i may come over to to you um what specific benefits does increased female representation bring to the digital and data teams? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, I, I think uh, the reason I'm reflecting is I don't think it brings any additional benefits that you wouldn't get anywhere else, which is around innovation, empathy, understanding your your end customer in um being more creative and so i think if you've got a team that thinks the same you will get the same outcome and um and the particularly in financial services there has been quite a lot of focus from the 
FCA, um, specifically around ensuring that the solutions that we're developing for those end customers are as well-rounded as possible. So, and, and in order to, to achieve the right digital solution, the right product, you need a range of people that have different perspectives. So you're, attract, you're, you're developing something that is attractive to a wider customer base. So it is, it's, I think it, it is very much around that innovation piece, that, that difference in thinking um, and being able to empathize with your end customer. Excellent, thanks very much for that, Dippy. Uh, and, and more than finally, a, a question that's come through for yourself. Um, with this being an election year, what can you tell us about how employers can best balance gender critical with gender expansive views? Oh, um, yes, that's that's very that's very interesting. Potentially uh, an explosive topic. Um, it's it's quite good actually to to consider sort of like that. What you then have is effectively a balancing of two protected beliefs under the Equality Act. And so with it being Pride Month right now, and again, I'm speaking as an LGBTQ plus person, what we end up having now is a situation where employers need to be very mindful of that you can't coerce your employees in one direction or another. And so the fact of the matter is, if you hold gender critical beliefs, that way, that everything that you want to believe in relation to gender, in biological sex and that reality, that belief is protected. And you are not then able to simply, you're, you don't have to put up with your employer doing the stonewall agenda, as it were, of effectively saying that you must sign up to this particular mode of thinking or ideology, as it's often derided as. Now, I don't happen to hold gender critical beliefs. I'm on the other side. I hold gender expansive beliefs. But again, the lawyer in me recognizes the risk and the compliance point that what you can do is you need to just be mindful always that the golden rule here is you are allowed to hold these beliefs, but you are not allowed to discriminate against others based on those beliefs. That's a fine line to tread but it's something that employers need to be mindful of. And you just have uh, a good example would be that if you're introducing a policy whereby you're going to be using pronouns in your email signatures, that's going to need to be voluntary rather than compelled. There'd be other examples too, but I think especially um, it's interesting to say about sort of the, uh, the election year point, because again, is that gender critical versus gender expansive is so often uh, manufactured and a lot of this dispute is manufactured as a front for a culture war but that's subject to another discussion on <laughs> <laughs> thank you. no thank you i wish i wish we had time to go on because we have we actually have more questions and everything you have all shared yeah i've even got a few questions i wanted to ask but thank you very much autumn dippy and warren for that that was super insightful i'm sure that we can all walk away with a number of tips there so thank you very much. Um, to everyone that's attended, thank you very much for joining. If you have any questions, please send them through. If you would like to speak to the speakers a bit more, please reach out to them on LinkedIn. Um, if you also would like to know a bit more about DE&I or you're looking or you're looking to hire in legal risk or compliance, also please reach out to us. Um, you can find more details on our website, that's www.thedanosgroup.com where we'll have all these details available. But again, Thank you to our amazing speakers and thank you to everyone who has joined. Thank you. Thanks very much.